don't you guys jump over to Numbers 25 with me? Yeah, Numbers 25. You're like, we're going into Numbers today? Yes, we are. Um, I want to talk to you guys about zeal and the jealousy of the Lord today. Uh, it's a really, in, really, really important topic. I think it's more important now for the church than ever before that we are walking in zeal um, and the jealousy of the Lord. Um, I, I've been stuck on this topic ever since I read this um, last year. I've just been waiting for the right time of like, Lord, when when do I get to talk about Phineas? And today's the day. Um, there, there's Zeal is a really, really important thing. It's something that can be confused because zeal can either be used in a really good way or in a really bad way. Um, you can have bad zealot, you could be a bad zealot or you could be a good zealot. Um, somebody full of zeal in the good sense, in my, in my perspective in front of what I've seen in the Bible, is somebody full of zeal is somebody who shares in the Lord's jealousy. Um, when Jesus, the only time you see Jesus make a whip and flip over tables is when he was zealous for the Lord. Um, when he went into the temple and saw that they were selling things they shouldn't have been selling and treating his temple as a way to make money and things like that, he went in there, started flipping tables, throwing pigeons everywhere. It was, it was wild. Um, and, and in that moment, the disciples make this, this thing and they're like, oh my gosh, this is what was written in Psalms, which is Psalm 69. It says, for the zeal, for zeal for your house has consumed me. And the reproaches of those who reproach you have fallen on me. So like, they're like, oh my gosh, this is that. Like he's full of zeal. The zeal for his house is consuming him. Zeal for the house is, is, you, is, is him partaking in the father's jealousy for his people. It's, it's the realization that, that God purchased us and made us a people of his pasture. Okay. He made you a people of his pasture and when you start moving outside of that pasture and then belong to something else, he gets real jealous. Yeah. Why? Because you belong to him. Yeah. You belong to him, not to somebody else. Um, and last year, we had this really crazy thing happen. Um, we had this FedEx guy come to our house. Um, and this FedEx guy, he, he drops off our package and he goes up to Leah. Here, come, come over here. Be my, be my wife. And I'll be the weird FedEx guy. <laughs> so this, he drops off this box, um, and we had never had anything like this happen before, but he drops off the box, and he's just like, I hope you have a good day. <laughs> like full, And she, like, she had to like push him off of her. So she call, Lydia calls me. She's like, hey, because I'm, I'm overworking in the barn next door. She's like, hey, the FedEx guy just got here, and he just gave me like a really long hug. And it was like intimate and weird. Um, and so what happened in me? Zeal, ra zeal arose in my heart. Why? Because she belongs to me and I belong to her. And somebody stepped in on that, right? So any dad, any husband, right? You're like, let's go, bro. Come on. I've been pumping iron in the gym waiting for this moment. And this is the one righteous excuse I have to absolutely throw down, right? <laughs> You're like, let's go. I, as a Christian, I get to walk in love. But this is my time because my love for her allows me to do this. So I'm just kidding. Um, so somewhere along the line, like, so basically what happens is like, we had to like call FedEx and we we're like, hey, this happened. It was inappropriate. We don't want him to lose his job. But like, this was... It crossed the line. He ends up texting me because he has, you know how you give FedEx your number, right? So he ends up texting me and I call him. I'm like, bro, I forgive you. We're good. If you ever do that again, like we're throwing down in my front yard. Like <laughs> we are, I'm telling you. And what, it, what, what that is, what that is is zeal. It's my jealousy for something that actually already belongs to me. Right? So you can actually be jealous. God's jealous for you right now. With the whole, like, he won't relent until he has it all. He's jealous for you because you belong to him. Right? And then when things get in the way and stuff starts pulling on your heart and taking you in different directions, he goes, no, nah, no, I'm not cool with that. And God will start throwing down on the things that are taking away from you. He'll start throwing down on the things that are trying to take your heart. 
Yeah. And, and so I want you guys to uh, stay at Numbers 25, but the very first instance in the Bible where God describes himself as a jealous God, note that he's the one who describes himself as a jealous God. It's not his people that go, oh, he's a jealous God. In a bad way, right? We take the word jealousy and we go, oh, that's not a good word. Like it's, oh, he's insecure about himself. He's not so sure about his relationship with, you know what I mean? Like anybody been around like a, per, like when me and Lydia first started dating, I had bad jealousy <laughs> where she'd get around other guys. And I'd be like, hey, well, hold up, hold up. That's my girl. I don't, I don't like you talking to him. You know, that's, that's insecure jealousy. Like she'd get around these guys from Bethel Music. I'm like, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> I'm over here and I look good too. I can't play the drums as good as that guy, but yeah, I can do things, right? That's insecure jealousy, right? And that's the, it's, not, it's not a secure jealousy, right? The Lord's not insecure about his jealousy for you. He bought you, right? I'm not insecure. If you came to my house and you're like, I own your house, I'd be like, no, bro, like get out of here. Like why? Because the deed has already been written. It already has my name on it. I'm not insecure on what, who owns what. I'd be like, bro, just like we could go down to the city right now and I'll show you. Right? Yeah. Like his, he purchased you with blood and it was the blood of Jesus. Okay. So he describes himself in Exodus 20. It's the very first commandment. He says, you shall have no other gods before me. In that Hebrew word, you, that, that phrase, you shall have no other gods in the Hebrew one of the best ways it could be translated it, that makes a bit more sense for us in context is you shall not prefer other gods to me. It's not just you can't have other gods, which you can't. It's also you shouldn't prefer other things to me. Like I need to be number one, right? It's not just like, like oh yeah, like I would like to be number one on your list. He's like, no, I actually don't even want to be ranked in the same list. Like, I can't be ranked. I am either all or I'm not. So he continues, he says, you shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me by showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. What's he do here? He establishes something. He says, if you are in, we'll call it the butter zone, the butter lane, whatever you want to call it. If you're in my will, my love will travel from generation to generation to generation. But if you want to yoke yourself with somebody that is actually stealing you from me, then you're going to walk in judgment and iniquity for generations to generations. Okay, I had this, uh, this thing happen with me and my mom. We're going to get into the judgment of the Lord really briefly here, okay? I don't, this whole sermon is not about the judgment of the Lord, but I just need to say it so that the next part makes sense. We went on this trip when we were kids. We went to this hotel down in Florida, and my, we're, we're, you know, just chilling out by the hot tub, catching lizards and things like that. Um, and my, uh, my mom is in the hot tub, and I go to step into the hot tub and my foot is on the outside of the hot tub. My other foot's in the hot tub. And I got grounded somehow and got electrocuted. Like, boom, just landed on my butt. Like it took my legs out underneath of me. I don't know how it happened. Boom, I'm like on the ground and I'm like, oh, what just happened? Like, I don't know if I screamed or, or whatnot, but I was like, what? I just remember in my head being like, my legs don't work. <laughs> what's happening? And then my mom goes, well, Ethan, what's happening? What's happening? And then she grabs me. And because I'm on the outside of the hot tub, I don't know how electricity works, but she touched me and then boom, now we're both electrocuted. And she's like, oh, like she immediately like, get out of the hot tub now. Get to the chopper. Um, so, so we're like, we got to get out of here. And, and my dad graciously went to the hotel and he was like, hey, your hot tub electrocuted us. They're like, how's a free buffet sound? <laughs> I'm like, they didn't give us anything other than a free buffet. We almost died. <laughs> so ask for more because I think he didn't ask for enough because I'm like, I should have like a college degree or something from this. <laughs> I'm just kidding. So... But I, I was, th was thinking about this this week where 
the judgment of the Lord is much like, it's like me standing outside of that hot tub. Like the Lord has judgment for anything that tries to separate his people from him. That judgment is coming down, will keep coming down anything that tries to separate us from the Lord, right? It's going boom. There's nothing stopping it. It's going right there, okay? So it's the enemy. It's all. It's the demons. It's everything that is against the Lord. That judgment is, it's not confused. Like if you stole my kid from me, you're going to experience the judgment of Ethan. Like I'm telling you, something would switch in the, the, my brain, I wouldn't care what happens to me. I will, get, I will break down every single wall and I will absolutely destroy whatever's taking my child, right? There's something that happens as a dad. You think about somebody taking your kid. You're like, I will, oh, don't even start right now, right? That's the judgment of God. It's love for the thing that, you, that belongs to you. Yeah? yeah? Okay, so here's the deal with the judgment of the Lord. When he says that the iniquities will follow the generations that follow, right? That's when we decide to step our foot in on something that was never created for us. It's when we dip our toe into a different dimension, into a different world, into something that's actually trying to steal from you. And all of a sudden, all these bad things start happening. Why? Because you stepped underneath the waterfall of judgment. It never was for you. It was for the enemy. But we sometimes decide, well, I kind of like this over here. And then bad things happen. We go, well, I don't understand why bad things are happening. <laughs> I don't get this. It's because you're experiencing the judgment of the enemy because you partnered with him. Okay? We, we here on that? Because we're going to get into it with Phineas here. So I have a quote I want to put up here on the screen. It says, what has my attention will have my affection. What has my attention will have my affection. What has my attention will have my affection. What you prefer reveals what's going on in your heart. I wrote this down this week. My preferences reveal the measure of my love for God. God's preferences reveal his immeasurable love for us. So my preferences, the thing I'm willing to entertain myself with, the things I give my attention to, that reveals my love for him. God's preferences actually reveal his heart for you. So when he says, I actually don't want you to have other gods, it's not because he just likes rules. It's because his preferences will actually lead you into his love into his abiding, into that butter zone, into the, 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 the reality of walking in peace, righteousness, no condemnation, no guilt, no shame. That's his will. So we have our own preferences, but the Lord has his preferences. Like I, tell, I say all the time when, when we do worship and stuff, and people are like, well, worship goes really long. That's because it's not about your preference. It's about his preference. Like what's his preference today? Well, I don't like the songs we sing. It's not your song, it's his songs. The, what our worship leaders are doing is they're praying beforehand going, Lord, what do you prefer today? What do you prefer last week? You know, like every week, I'm not just like, yeah, I want a steak dinner. Some days I'm like, oh, steak dinner sounds so good. Another day I might be like, man, pizza just sounds so good. Right? That's not because we're fickle. It's because we prefer different things, different days, because we're relational right? God's relational. We've turned worship into, well, let's play three songs and we'll end in an hour and then it's good. Right? Coffee's great. <laughs> you guys are like awake today. We removed the wall and everybody's like, we're engaged. Let's go. <laughs> right? Like we, we've just turned worship into us, right? And I've talked about this. I'm not going to keep beating, beating on it, but we have to understand God has preferences, and his commandments actually lay out his preferences for you. And so if my preferences reveal my love for him, his preferences are going to reveal his love for me. So if he's like, man, I want an hour of your worship, that reveals that he wants an hour of connection. It's not an hour of singing. It's an hour of intimate connection with him. Okay? Okay, we're going to get to jealousy here. If his, if his preference is for us to abide in him, that means his preference is to dwell with us. Get that. If his preference is for us to abide with him, 
That means his preference is to abide with you. I don't even think you guys understand how intense that is. He's not just like, hey, I need you to abide in me. I need you to actually spend time with me. It's because he wants to dwell with you. It's because he desires to spend time with you. Don't say, not just us, with you. Dude, that's good news. You know what that tells me is that he likes me. That tells me that he likes you. That you might say, well, I don't think God likes me. I don't think he wants to be around me. I don't know that. I know he loves me, but I don't know if he likes me. Ever heard that before? Well, I can love them. I just don't like them. That's not how God is. He loves you and he likes you. So when he says, I want to abide with you and dwell with my people, that's his desire, not yours. The best thing you can do is partner your desire to his desire to be with you. That, to me, that's like one of the most wonderful things ever is that he actually wants to be here in our Sunday morning services and in my car driving home and me cheering for a Lions game. And like, he actually wants me to, he wants to be with me more than I want to be with him. It's amazing. But what my give my attention to, that's going to give my, that's where my affection is going to go. So if my attention's on video games, if my attention's on the news, if my attention's on social media, if my attention's on my 401k, if my attention's somewhere else more than him, my affection is going to go. And we wonder, I just don't know why I don't feel God. It's because your affection's somewhere else. We need to have zeal for where our affection is going and laser it in back on God. And that's what it is. Zeal, zeal for his house will consume him. It's partnering in the jealousy that God's actually actively jealous for you right now. There are things in our lives right now that he's jealous for. It could be YouTube. It could be Netflix. It could be whatever it is. It's something that could be stealing from you. It could be addictions. It could be drugs. It could be whatever it is. Like he's jealous for it. Okay, so let's get to Phineas here. You guys good? We're good? Try not to go too fast. Bill Johnson says this. So with, well, let me give you some context. So Phineas is the grandson of Aaron. So you have Moses and Aaron. Aaron was the first high priest of all of Israel. Phineas is Aaron's grandson, okay? So we have like two generations later after Israel has come out of Egypt but we start to see the decay of what happens when we start to follow our will and lose our, our zeal for the Lord. So Bill Johnson says this. He says, it took God one day to get Israel out of Egypt, but it took 40 years to get Egypt out of Israel. So one day it takes God to get Israel out of Egypt, 40 years to get Egypt out of the heart of Israel. Crazy. What does that tell me? That yes, I can accept the Lord as my Savior. I can say, yes, you're my king, but I got to keep walking with him. I have to keep walking with him. And I have to keep letting my heart become pure, more righteous, walking in, in holiness, right? It's not enough just to say, I'm a Christian. And I go to church. It's, you have to actually submit yourself to him so he can get that Egypt out of your heart, right? Okay, so Phineas is like that for me. So let me give you some context. So at this time, point in time, you have like this other nation, um, and you have this other nation called Moab, and then you have Israel. They're both out in the wilderness. Moab is like their neighbor. And Moab is trying to figure out how in the world do we infiltrate Israel and bring Israel to their knees? And so for three years, they're trying to figure out how do we do this? Like, how do we how do we conquer Israel? There's too many of them. What do we do? So for three years, they're, they're, the fathers of Moab are trying to do this and they can't do it. But then the daughters of Moab actually figure out a way to do it. So where the fathers failed, the daughters succeed. And what that is, is they led them into Baal worship. So th this is the same Baal that the prophets of Baal with Elijah, right? They're all, they're like cutting themselves. They're like worshiping this, this other God. And really what Baal is, if we're going to like give it a picture, Baal is, is the worship of the human body. It's the worship of sexuality. It's the worship of, uh, it's, it's loving the things of man more than God. Are you guys still with me here? So Moab starts to infiltrate Israel. 
not through means of war, but through means of intimacy, through means of sexuality and sexual confusion. Hello. What does that sound like? Sounds a lot like America right now, right? And what happens is Israel becomes seduced and they start to begin following the influence of Moab instead of following the influence of God. And here's the deal in America right now. We're all, we all, there's just influencers everywhere. Influencers everywhere. Instagram, Facebook. You can make like six figures like that just by being an influencer on TikTok. Yeah? God called Israel to be the influencer, not to be influenced. And here's the deal. Israel's out in the wilderness and he's like, I made you a people of my pasture, a people for me. So your only influence is me so that I can lead you into the promised land. Okay. But then all of a sudden all these other nations start coming up and they start to get influenced. And God's like, that's not what I told you to do. It was one voice that was supposed to be influencing them. Okay. So Numbers 25 comes. Okay. While Israel lived in Shittim, the people began to whore with the daughters of Moab. These invited the people to sacrifices for their gods, and the people ate and bowed down to their gods. So Israel yoked himself to Baal, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. So when it says that the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, it means that God started to send the plagues of Egypt to Israel. That quote, the Bill Johnson quote, right? God was trying to get Egypt out of Israel. How did he get Israel out of Egypt? Through plagues. What did Israel do? They started to step into the hot tub of judgment. That was never meant for them, right? Never meant for them. What does that say? That does not say that God is an angry God. It says that God will be angry with anything that tries to separate his people. Yeah. Right? Okay, so, so here's the deal. They start to step unto, into the judgment of the Lord. I, I could compare it to, you know, you have the righteous ones of Israel and you have the enemy, the people that are trying to influence into all things of darkness. It's like taking two wires and then using a wire nut, nutting them together. They became one. And so now that current of judgment is now flying into Israel. So Israel is now walking in the act of judgment of God instead of the act of righteousness of God. That's crazy. And you go, why? Like, why? You know, it's really easy for us to look back and go, I don't understand what's the problem here. Like, God's a good God. He's, there's, there's food raining from heaven. Like, they're waking up every morning, there's food on the ground. They're having, like, literally meat fall from the sky. Dude, I will take porterhouses from the sky any single day. <laughs> Bring it. And yet they're still frustrated. Moses is smacking rocks and there's water coming out of them. Like he is providing and yet they still keep going to another. So check this. Verse four, it says, And the Lord said to Moses, Take all the chiefs of the people and hang them in the sun before the Lord, that the fierce anger of the Lord may turn away from Israel. And Moses said to the judges of Israel, Each of you kill those of his men who have yoked themselves to Baal. And behold, one of the people of Israel came and brought a Midianite woman to his family in the sight of Moses and in the sight of the whole congregation of the people of Israel while they were weeping in the entrance of the tent of meeting. So here is a really important thing, because Phineas is about to pop onto the scene. It's about to get crazy. But this son of Israel, while there's, there's the judgment of God's happening, they're finding essentially the people. It'd be like me as your pastor saying, hey, what we're going to do is we're, we're not going to do this whole Jesus thing anymore. What we're going to do is worship our sexuality. Okay? So we're not talking about Jesus anymore. We're going to talk about our truth, and we're going to follow our own sexual desires. So let's go. What Moses did was he said, find those guys and we're going to have our, ourselves a good old hanging, <laughs> right? Sorry, there's kids in here, so we're, <laughs> let's make it less hard, but it's true. Okay, so while that's happening in the courts of the holies of holies, okay, this Midianite woman in this, in this Israel son, he, they come out to the outsides of the courts and it, it doesn't state what's going on here, but I, I read this commentary where it says, it says, uh, through somebody who's much more scholarly than I, it says, the man is a blasphemer in the strongest sense. His sin is a deliberate provoca provocator of the wrath of the Lord, 
flaunting and taunting holiness in an almost unbelievable cru crudity. The issue was so blatant, so outrageous, so unspeakable. I suggest that the ancients had to hide the meaning somewhat in code words. Those who read the text today find between the words that stand, which are awful enough, something that is truly an outrage against majesty that is nearly unbelievable. Most of those who saw this happening must have been so shocked that they were motionless. They must have been stunned by audacity, numbered by horror. Someone had to do something. Finally, one man would act. So what this man and woman did, they did some something. Like they did a, you know, you can, you imagine it. It could have happened. Like it, it, they did something in the public for everybody to see while they were mourning their unrighteousness in by the holy of holies so that's like somebody coming in the back of the room and doing some awful thing and then everybody's just sitting there going what in the goodness gracious just happened and here's the deal is they were flaunting their unrighteousness unto god's people and to god so what was happening is there was a cancer that was happening within israel it wasn't just like a man and a woman. It was a sign of a cancer that was growing within Israel. And if that cancer continued to spread, it would consume the entire thing. So God, like a good surgeon, he picks up his knife and he says, we're going to cut this out. Does that make sense? Yeah. So Phineas is about to be his scalpel, okay? So verse 7, when Phineas, the son of El. El Oh, Eleazar, I always mess that up. Son of Aaron, the priest, saw it. He rose and left the congregation and took a spear in his hand and went after the man of Israel into the chamber and pierced both of them. The man of Israel and the woman threw her belly. Thus, the plague on the people of Israel was stopped. Nevertheless, those who died by the plague were 24,000, which was about 10% of Israel's uh, population. And the Lord said to Moses, Phineas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, has turned back my wrath from the people of Israel in that he was jealous with my jealousy among them so that I did not consume the people of Israel in my jealousy. Therefore, I say, behold, I give him my covenant of peace and it shall be to him and to his descendants after him the covenant of a perpetual priesthood because he was jealous for his God and made atonement for the people of Israel. So Phineas actually became the hand of God and surgically removed the cancer of Baal from the people. So it wasn't just sin. It was Baal was rising up as a new God, as a new preference among the people of Israel. And Phineas, instead of sitting there going, I don't know why America's like this. I don't know how we got here. How are we having these things happen in public with these kids watching? How is this happening? Instead, he said, I'm not just going to watch this. We're going to act. Like, we're going to act. Okay. Now, today, 21st century, I'm not saying go pick up a machete and go to a protest and be dumb. Okay. I'm not saying that. Je Jesus said to Peter, right? Peter has this moment of, of, of being zealous for the Lord where they're about to take, it, take Jesus. He picks up a sword, cuts an ear off. Jesus heals the ear. And he's like, dude, if you use that sword, you're going to die by that sword. Okay, so I'm not talking about violence. I'm talking about the moral dilemma at hand. You understand? Phineas took action where others watched. Okay, he was the only one. An entire congregation of people, they're seeing something happen. And he goes, yeah, I'm, not, I'm just not cool with this. And it's not because I'm not cool with this. It's because God actually is not cool with this. And so he priests unto God. Do you know what a priest does? A priest is a mediator between a people and the God. That's what a priest does. A priest is, it's the in-between. It's the, it's the person that you would go to and you say, I have sinned. I have fallen short. And he would say, don't worry, there's blood for that. There's blood for that. There's a priestly duty in that. And so as a priest, he steps in and says, don't worry, we're going to remove this thing so that you can be in right standing with God. And then boom, the, the judgment ceases. So what, is, what, is this, what does this even mean for, for us? Again, what has my attention will have my affection. Phineas had his attention on God. 
can, it, can we, like, his, he had his attention on God. So when something else came in, he was like, no, this is just not right. It's not right. Like, this is not what the Lord created us for. It's not us. It's not you. And here's the deal. When, when, when you encounter sin, when people start sinning in your life and people, well, I can't believe they betrayed me like that. I just, like, dude, I've been through it, man. Like, I've been in the trenches where somebody's speaking things that are not true about me and things like that. Here's, here's what happens in your heart. You go, zeal rises up within you and you go, man, if they knew who they were, they would have never done that. If they knew what, what the Lord had done for them, they would have never done that. If they knew the mercy of God, they would have never done that. Right, And instead of zeal coming to go attack somebody, your zeal actually rises up against the thing that's actually hurting them. Well, I just can't believe that they would do that to me. I can't believe that they would say that about me. They know better, right? We also, when people are Christians, we're like, well, they should know better. They've heard the gospel. They've been to church, right? And we start creating these higher degrees of things for people and in reality, it's like, it's not about them. Something's stealing from them. Their foot is in a different tub. Of course they're acting wonky. They're living wonky because their affection is in a wonky place. So when I see stuff on the news and, and the things that people are doing, and my goodness, like our world is getting wonky and upside down. There's kids identifying as cats. Like, come on. There's kids, like I have friends in Utah, they literally have multiple kids in their elementary school who identify as cats. They, they like go in litter boxes at their school. That is wonky and we need to call it wonky. It's not what God created for them, right? And we've turned, here's the deal is, is what happens. Okay, I'm not, you, I promise this is not a political, I'm, you guys know me, I'm like not a political dude. The, here's what happens is we start to go, well, I don't, but that's where they're at right now. That's like, that's where their thought process is. Like that's, and, and we try to, we try to enable and protect the heart, not realizing, no, that's a cancer. It's going to kill them. It's going to steal against them. We need to not just go, oh, I'm sorry. We actually need to go, no, that's not who you are. I love you enough to say that's not who you are. Like, it's, you were created by God in your mother's womb. Like, he has plans and a purpose for you. And if you think you're a cat, your voice is not going to matter. Yeah. And it matters. It matters. You know what I mean? Like, it's, it's something where we need to take zeal and jealousy that the Lord has for the things that are stealing from his people and from his kids and go, no, no. And here's what Phineas did is he didn't lower his standard. What, what we like to do, what we like to do is this. We like to go, you know what? I know the Bible says that, but this is how I feel. I know that the Bible says that, but no. Nah. This is, well, this is my understanding, right? And, and here's the deal. Like God, he doesn't lower the standard for anybody. That's what I love about him. Like I'm not special enough to change his mind. Come on, right? He like this thing is so rock solid, stable. It's the most stable thing you have in your life because he's not going to change his mind about you and he's not going to change his mind about his preferences. I love that. That's actually great news. Because in a world where everything goes, well, it's my truth and truth is constantly changing and our understanding is always different and I don't know about he's just so stable. When my world is, it's exactly what Becky was talking about. When we're getting tossed to and fro, he's like, I'll be the rock that just stays put. Yeah. Mm. I promise you, I'm not trying to be offensive. If this message is offending you, please understand, like my heart is not to offend. My heart is to say, there are things in culture right now influencing you and me saying this is normal and God's going, it's not. Normal, right, is not up to me. Truth is not up to me. It is a rock that doesn't move. So it's not my truth. It's not your truth. It's either his or it's not. 
dude, I know, like, I'm getting ready to get stoned. Like, you know what I mean? Like, like I, I'm just saying, like, there's a, there's a very real reality where, like, as a lead pastor, we are headed, if, if the church itself doesn't start standing up on truth and go, I know that's what you think, it's just not true. Because here's the deal. We've allowed the loudest person in the room to silence us. Whoever's the loudest, that's the voice that gets heard. It's just like, there has to be a point, not that we get loud, but we just go, no, I'm not flinching. And that's, that's all it is. I'm not saying revolt. I'm not saying, li- like, I'm not saying go to protest and be the loudest, angriest person. No, that is like, it, pfft, that's like the ugliness that we, nobody needs to see, right? It's just, it makes God look ugly. Okay, what makes God look amazing is when his people confidently stand on the rock and say, I love you even though we disagree. I love you. I just know what the Lord has for you. And it's not in following your own desires. It's in following his. You can follow your desires forever. But I promise you at the very end of that following that, you're just going to get to nothing. That itch, I say it all the time, that itch, you're going to keep on scratching. It's just never going to feel good. You'll keep itching. You might have a moment of relief. It's just going to keep itching. God is the only thing that satisfies. Okay, so this is what Phineas did. Why is Phineas so important? Phineas is so important because we talk about the covenant of Adam, the covenant of Abraham, the covenant of David. We don't talk about the covenant the covenant of uh, Phineas. God makes a covenant, which is a gr- agreement with Phineas. And it's honestly crazy. We don't talk about it. Phineas, when he steps into the zeal and jealousy of the Lord, the Lord says, now your generations are going to be blessed by a priestly, a priestly priesthood of peace. But you're like, but his life looked violent, but it ushered in peace. And here's the thing, and, and we talked about it before, if you were here for that, that message of David, I remember that that's my sword, right? The things the enemy points at you, it's actually yours, that's your sword. And here's what Phineas did is the enemy pointed his sword at Israel and he was like, no, that's mine. That's ours. Like you're, you're trying to get us to worship. Oh, we're going to worship. Come on. Oh, we're going to worship. We're just not worshiping you. Right? Like we're going to worship. And that's the thing. Everything right now in your society, I promise you, your phone, it's programmed to get you to worship. This is a worship device. You're like, I don't, I don't know if I agree with that, Ethan. It is. Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, everything, its whole goal is to keep you watching. That's why it gives you notifications when you haven't picked it up in a while. It goes, hey, or, or where were you at? Come back. Oh, keep watching. Hey, you're going to like this one. I've looked at all the other things you've been watching. Here's another. It's real, dude. Like, this is a worship machine. And, and, and... He, what, what we do is we go, well, I, 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 I love God. I'll give him some of my time. But we give him the breadcrumbs because we really like our phones. We give him the breadcrumbs because we really love our video games. We really love that TV show. We really love the news. I'm not saying don't stay informed. I'm not saying that entertainment is bad. What I'm saying is that when he is not the highest place in your heart, Dude, it's going to get into trouble. And dude, like many of you in this room, you have small kids. One of the best things you can do for your kids is bring them to church and show them there is someone that we love. There is someone that we love higher than the things that are in front of us. More than Netflix, more than YouTube, more than our tablets, more than our Nintendo Switches, more than, you know what I mean? Like I have all those things. Like we have Nintendos. We have, like, I'm not, we're not living in the Stone Age at our house, okay? But like, here's the deal. Like when it's like, okay, kids, what are we going to be entertained by? It's like, let's put on some Jesus cartoons. Let's do Bible cartoons. Let's do things that will actually inspire them to pursue the Lord. And you're like, well, Ethan, there's so many other things like Bluey. We love Bluey. But there's other things that we can talk to our kids about. Ah, Okay. What, so we're landing the plane here. I did, I'm doing great on timing, guys. This was a big message. I'm surprised I'm landing it this quick, okay? 
So what does this look for us look like for us practically? When I spoke to the youth this week, that I love our youth. Um, is Ellie in here? I think she's in the back. She was just like, what does this even look like, Ethan? Like just straight, like our youth are just straight up. They're like, what, how do I get zeal? Is what she asked me. And I loved that question. So here's, I want to go through something. Three different things here. How do we walk like Phineas walked? It looks like walking in conviction and integrity, regardless of what the crowd is doing. He didn't let the loud voice of the enemy hush the voice of God in his life. So we have to ask ourselves this question. What shows are people watching that you shouldn't be watching? What kind of language are you using that your friends use, but God doesn't use? What substances are you consuming that you know God is not cool with you consuming? What distractions do you prefer to God? That's a really good one. What distractions do I like more than God? And you, like, do not look at me and go, oh, Ethan's above this. He's figured this out. No, there's actually real distractions that I prefer. And I have to submit those to God. You get five minutes of just alone time. You're at the doctor's office, whatever, five minutes. You're like, oh, this is a great time to just scroll. What if that five minutes was just a good time to just thank the Lord? I'm not, I'm being for real, guys. Like, what if that was five minutes of just being able to say, Lord, thank you for my health. Thank you for my family. Lord, thank you that you are teaching me patience. You're teaching my home to be a place of patience and peace. Lord, thank you that you're leading my kids to you. Like, what if that five minutes was just a moment for you to connect with them? But we love distractions. If we're being real, we love it. Am I the only one? Like, we like to fill our time. Oh, I don't have anything fun to do this week. Let's go find something. And sometimes it's like, we just have to kick it back a gear and just go, man, where's the Lord right now? Like, where's the Lord in my life? Where's the Lord in my home? Like, am I making time? And dude, for me, this was this is something where I had to just go, okay, it's Saturday. Yesterday, like this has been a reoccurrence for me on Saturday. Usually Saturdays, it's like, I wanna play video games with my kids. I wanna watch TV shows. Like, I just wanna kick it back and have a good time. And for me, I had to ask myself, I'm like, man, when I have time, because I know many of us were like, we just don't have time. When I have time, what do I do with my time? And that was where I was like, okay, Saturdays, I want my kids to see me reading my Bible. Not just me in my closet alone, but I want them to actually observe me reading my Bible. Like them observing me and me observing me, <laughs> leading myself to the Lord. Yeah? So the first is not lowering your convictions and your integrity based off the sphere around you. If your friends are watching, like, I don't know, some crazy show, Game of Thrones, whatever, that show came out, everybody was watching Game of Thrones. I was me and Christian watching that show. I'm like, how are you watching that? How? It's like, it's literally, it's just, I can't say it because there's kids in here, it's, but Dude, it, it's like, but there was Christians just like, yeah, it's so good. I'm like, I don't understand how you can even watch it with your spouse. It doesn't even make sense to me. But, but and it, it's not me. Like, again, that's not, I don't want high, Christians on their high horses. Can we please make sure that that's not what you're walking away with? We're not going to be Christians on our high horses. Oh, did you hear what Becky's watching? Can you believe it? Like, that's not what I'm doing here. Can we please just make it, make that known? Like, we are a people of love and of patience. And when we see people walking in sin, we can go, the Lord's going to lead them into righteousness. And we pray for them and not gossip about them. Okay? So, but when, you, when you're with your coworkers and they start talking about different shows they're watching, like I'm watching, I'm with my, my coworkers and they're like, oh, have you seen this show? Oh, it's so good. I'm like, no, I haven't seen it. They're like, you have to watch it. I was like, I actually can't. They're like, why? Because there's so many things in that that don't fit my values. That's saying my integrity and my convictions are just, they're not going to budge just like God's. And we need that, guys. Like I, I've seen more Christians in the last five years just go with the flow. You know what happens when you go with the flow? You're building that house on sand. As soon as that storm comes in, boom, 
And then you're left wondering, I don't even know if I believe in God. You just, the reason why you don't believe in God is because you made up a version of him. You believed in celebrity Jesus, not deny yourself Jesus. <laughs> like he said, deny yourself. He didn't say when it's convenient. He said, deny yourself. Okay, here we go. Two more. You with me? You believe me? Ellie sent me this. Sorry, I'm talking about you a lot, Ellie. Ellie sent me this thing on, on Instagram where she's like, where it's like when the pastor says he's landing, he's landing the message and it's a half hour later. And you, and, then, and now anytime the pastor says well, he's landing the message, you're like, I don't believe you. And I was like, no, Ellie, I do land the plane on time. Tray tables up, buckle up. Here we go, we're landing. The second thing Phineas did is he said he took action because he understood that to not take action was sin in and of itself. He took action when to not take action was to sin. He never lowered the standard. When sin is sin, don't lower the standard. Sometimes we ignorantly dip our toes in sin, knowing it's sin, but we wait to either hit rock bottom get caught in it, or hear a good message to get us out of it. Sometimes we just think, well, I think it's cool. I think, I think we're good. And we start to walk the tightrope. I've heard people say like, you know, we, there, there's, the, there's the devil, the fence, and God. And some of us like to walk on the fence, but the devil owns the fence. And some of us, we just we like to do a little both. And I'm telling you that it's, it's the hot tub, guys. You stick your foot in that, it will always destroy. He only kills, he only seals, he only destroys. But Jesus is only life and only joy and only abundance. Okay? It's just not worth it. So, like, don't convince yourself that you get to do both. You don't. You don't. We need to be jealous, share in the jealousy of the Lord in our own life and go, Lord, what are you jealous of in my life? Like, what are you looking at in my heart, in Ethan's heart right now? What are you looking at and going, I want that. He doesn't want to share you guys. Come on. He doesn't want to share you. He bought you. That is good. That means he wants you and he's not cool with sharing you because he likes you. What the enemy is taking aim at in society. I'm sorry, here, better question. Here we go. What is the enemy taking aim at in society that we should be taking aim at? We were called to influence culture, not to be influenced. So when we start going, man, I don't know why our politics are like this. Maybe we should be aiming at it. Maybe we should be praying that the Lord rises up righteous politicians. Maybe we should be praying that our, our government would have the wisdom and understanding to make the changes that need to happen. Yeah? Maybe we should be praying for the people in authority right now and not go, God, I can't stand Joe Biden. Gosh. Maybe we should be going, Lord, give him wisdom. Give the people around him wisdom. Give them understanding. Give them righteousness and holiness. But instead we go, I just can't stand Donald Trump. Can't believe him. And we criticize, but Paul says, pray for the people in authority because God put them there. Sorry, can't go there because we're landing. Last point. Being a priest, a priest of peace in our spheres of influence, Phineas was interceding between God and people as a priest. He was mediating. Jesus is our mediator before God. So our job is to pray with zeal and jealousy. Jesus is, he's the mediator. He intercedes for us. So if you are a people of priesthood, it says in Revelations that, that he's caused us to become a kingdom of priests. If Jesus is interceding and mediating between us and God, going, God, I've covered them with my blood. They're amazing. I love them. Look at all that we've done together. Like, and, and Jesus is actively praying for you right now. Like, he's like, oh my gosh, I know that they're going through something so hard. Lord, we thank you for who they are, what you're going to do through them. And he's praying that your will would align with his will. 
Okay, so if that's what he's doing to God, what's my job? My job is to intercede between Jesus, me, and the people that are making all the mistakes and the people that I love and my family and my friends. My job is to say, Lord, I thank you for who they are, what you have done. Lord, would you bring their will into your will? And so then we link hands with Jesus and we link hands with the world, whether they want it or not. And we say, I'm going to pull you into his will. Lord, not, your, not my will be done, but yours. Let heaven come to earth. If he's interceding, you should be interceding. Oh, you are called to be a priest. You're like, well, I don't want to be a priest. You're called to be one. Well, Ethan, you're the priest. No, I, I'm, I'm the priest of this house. I'm the priest of my house. But guess what? You're the priest of your house. And the best part about you coming to church today, it reveals to you, to your family, that you want to actively priest in your house. What does actively priesting in your house mean? It means that you are leading your children and your family and your spouse and you are connecting them to Jesus as the mediator. In England, when you go down into the underground, the, the, the tube or whatever they call it, um, what's it called? The, no, not the catacombs. The, uh, it's their subway, but they have a name for it. It's not important. <laughs> I can't remember what they call it, but... When you go there, I've been there, that they go, mind the gap, mind the gap. And it's, they're mi you're minding the gap between the train and yourself and where you're standing. And here's the deal is God needs people who will mind the gap, who will say, I see the gap between society and God, between culture and God and the things that are influencing us. And we go, there's a gap here. So I'm going to grab God's hand and I'm going to grab my family's hand, my friend's hand, culture, and I'm going to be the gap and mind the gap and bring them together. That's what he needs right now. And guess what? It's not the pastors who are going to do it. It's the people. It's his people. He's looking for people who will be like Phineas and will go before the entire people and literally deliver them from a plague, from judgment of God, and bring God and people together. That's what royal priesthood means. And you're like, man, Ethan, I've been saved for like one day. I, like, I don't even know what I believe about God yet. Well, guess what? That's what he's called you to do. You're like, well, I'm not ordained. You don't need to be ordained. His blood ordained you. Come on. He, he ordained you to be sons and daughters of God. Yeah, okay, stand up. We're in. Okay, that's half of my sermon now. We're just going to stretch and we're going to get ready for part two right now. So this is what I want you to ask yourself. Put your hand on your heart, close your eyes, whatever you need to do. Just ask the Lord right now, what are you jealous of in my life? Is there something in my life that you were jealous over? What do I think belongs to me that actually belongs to you? What am I hiding from you? Here's a good question. What do you prefer over God? And that's a very good indicator. What do I prefer over God? And being honest with yourself, we're not adding judgment, we're not shaming, we're not condemning. There's a very real aspect of realizing there's, there's just something powerful that happens when we go, when we're just honest with ourselves and go, I actually prefer TV over God. That's like, that's okay. The, it, what, what you need to do with it though, is to say, God, teach me not to prefer TV over you. Teach me. That's why he sent the Holy Spirit to be a helper. Lord, would you help me prefer you over other things? And he'll do it. He will. He's faithful. It's just your job to be disciplined enough to, su to subject yourself to his influence. But when we're being influenced and our attention is on other things, of course we're going to have our affections going to follow. Of course our attention is going to follow that. And our affection is going to follow that. It's just positioning your heart to go, man, Lord, I want my attention to be on you so that my affection is on you. 
And so, Lord, I ask right now, you would rearrange, you would clear out the clutter, that you would clear the way right now in Jesus' name, in our hearts and in our lives. Lord, that you would just get rid, help us get rid of the clutter. Help us clear the way for you, Lord, that we would be zealous for you, that we'd be full of and and partner with the jealousy of God in our lives, in our homes, in our societies, in our education systems, in our jobs, Lord. that, that we would be jealous for you, Lord, that there be th- that we would see the things that actually belong to you and that we would give them a name, that we would see them and go, that belongs to God. It does not belong to us. It belongs to him. So Lord, would you convict us today? Amen. And I just think today, like you, I say it all the time, but write it down. Like, write down what are the things that I prefer over God. Put it on a list and literally every day say, Lord, I want to prefer you over this. I want to prefer you over this. That's removing that thing from your highest preference and making him your preference. And yeah, some days, guess what? You might, you might not be on the straight and narrow. You might have it, your preference above, okay? The goal is that that thing would be, would either get absolutely burnt to the crown. You might literally need to start throwing some stuff away. But like, here's the deal. The the goal is that he would have the highest place in your heart, that your zeal and jealousy would match his. Yeah? Amen.